Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be continuing our look at trusses. In particular, we will be exploring the two uh, primary methods of determining truss internal member forces, both the uh, method of joints and the method of sections. We'll be describing each in a little detail, and we'll start by working. We'll start working through our examples by looking at a uh, quick example of solving uh, for truss internal forces uh, using the method of joints, and then this will be followed up by later videos that work through long form examples of both the method of joints and the method of sections. <coughs> So the topic for today is quantitative methods of determining um, uh, truss internal forces, and there are going to be two main methods we consider. So, and, and of course, this is a, uh, this is a follow up to our previous discussions on truss theory. We've gone into great depth discussing um, various theoretical aspects of trusses, and now I just want to go and look at the uh, sort of nitty gritty nuts and bolts methods uh, of determining the actual forces inside truss members. So the key thing to keep in mind, uh, at least for this discussion, the key things for theor from theory. I know we had two hour long lectures on trust theory, but uh, what I really want to cover, or what's going to be most useful for our uh, for our mathematical approach, where we actually solve for the internal forces in, in trusses, there's two things we need to keep in mind. Uh, one, uh, all truss members and again, truss member is defined uh, where you have straight members with pin joints and loads applied only at joints. But all truss members, so the def this is the definition of truss members, and then all truss members, uh, the key thing to keep in mind about those is that they will carry one and only one internal force. And that is an axial force, which will be either tension or compression. And as a reminder on sign convention, uh, for this analysis, we'll be treating tension as positive and compression as negative. So tension will be positive and compression will be negative. Uh, so that's our one important thing to keep in mind. And then the other one that I really want to look at is determining whether a, uh, is finding whether a truss is determinant. So uh, whether a truss is determinant And that is our M plus R and 2J. So it is determinant if M plus R, well, it's determined and stable if M plus R is equal to 2J. So that's our ideal case. Um, but in particular, if M plus R is greater than 2J, then it is going to be indeterminate. should will likely be quite stable, but it will be indeterminate. Okay. So we have uh, two, so those are just, that's just a bit of a review from our prior work. So now let's go ahead and explore or describe the two main methods of solving for uh, truss internal forces. So methods of solving trusses, or I should say analyzing trusses. of analyzing trusses, <clears throat> and there will be two of them. Uh, the first is going to be the method of joints, and in the method of joints, the way we will solve this is by um, sort of drawing the truss in an exploded view. Basically, replacing all of their all of the members simultaneously with their uh, replace all members with the uh, forces that they represent. Uh, 
So replace all members with forces. So we're going to replace all members with the forces they represent and then uh, solve for the forces. Uh, and then solve using uh, just repeated sum of forces X and sum of forces Y on each joint. So that's a quick description of the method of joints, but we will look at that after this. And then we have the method of sections. And the method of sections is most useful when you're looking for, uh, especially when you have a more uh, complicated truss. And if you're if you're only interested in the internal force in a few key members, uh, say for example, if you have a, well, we'll look at it, I should say. Um, I'll just say for now, I, I could go into depth about it, but I'll just say for now that the method of sections is useful when you're trying to solve for just a few forces, especially in uh, especially forces in members that are at the interior of trusses. So useful for finding a key a few key members. It's a very rapid way to do that. Uh, for getting a few key member forces. And just like it is implied, we will cut a section of the whole truss. And we'll see what that looks like. Of the whole truss and then analyze. Uh, with sum of forces X, sum of forces Y, and a balance of moments. So equilibrium. So with the method of sections, we will be cutting out a section in the truss and then uh, applying equilibrium uh, with the unknown forces uh, to solve for our unknown forces that are revealed by that cut in summation of forces X, Y, and uh, summation of moments. Okay. And I know I went through that fairly quickly. I just wanted to introduce the methods for uh, right now. So. And so we're going to then uh, move on to look at the method of joints. So let us consider the method of joints. Alright, so let's consider the method of joints. Which you might which you might infer involves something that's legal in Oregon but not in other areas of the country, but uh, that is not the case. Here we're talking about structural joints. Got to get that deadpan delivery. Anyway, so uh, method of joints. Again, we will be uh, drawing the truss in exploded view. Not the view does not start with a W. So we'll draw out an exploded view. And the exploded view uh, in a truss, for example, will label all joints. And I usually simply assume tension for all forces. That's usually the best way to do that. So I usually just assume tension on all internal forces. And then if I get a negative in my analysis, I simply know then that I have a, a, a negative uh, force, or in other words, I have compression. And it will be acting in the direction opposite the tension would act. So I usually assume tension, which again is our positive internal force. And then we'll apply some of forces X sum of forces y uh, to each joint. And often, though, it, it will be useful to, uh, often it is useful to, uh, you can apply global equilibrium to solve for reactions if possible. Often that is beneficial. So apply global equilibrium 
uh, to solve for reactions first. And that is especially useful if you have just uh, three reaction forces. And so I can say, especially if R equals three. If you have three reactions, uh, if you have three reactions, you know that your truss is going to be externally uh, determinate. In other words, you can solve for all of the uh, external reactions using only a single free body diagram of the truss as a whole. And then, and so it's very easy to directly solve for the reactions that way, uh, knock those out and then have a starting point uh, for your equilibrium with your method of joints. So if I ever have just three reaction forces, I'll usually start my method of joints by uh, applying a, uh, by looking at a global free body diagram first. Although I think it may help to illustrate this with a uh, simplified example, a relatively simple example. Alright, so let's draw a lovely truss, a nice friendly truss, just like happy trees, just a happy truss. Oh, get that out of the way here. Okay. So let's say you have a truss, oh, let's do just a simple sort of pentagonal truss. Something like this. Actually, um, actually, I might trim this a bit. This is not quite the shape I'm going for. Want it a little taller. Not quite that long because I'm trying to do every. Uh, so that would be better for a bit more uh, lengthy example. But here, I just want to work through something relatively simple, and then follow up in our example videos, uh, looking in depth at these. So let's say you have a relatively simple truss. Start with a square. Something like this. And then with a crossbar like this. Oh, and then let's go ahead and make this nice and simply supported. Okay, so first let's determine whether, oh, and I guess I should probably put some loads on this. Um, let's go ahead and apply a relatively simple load of, oh, I don't know, let's put a 10 kip load like this to the right and a maybe a 6 kip downward load applied to there. I'll go ahead and label some joints. Let's just say A, B, C, D, E, and F. So I'll go ahead and label my reaction forces. Um, I would have, uh, now the nice thing is this is a nice simply supported truss. Um, so I'm gonna have a CY and a CX and an FY. So three external reaction forces. Uh, what else? Oh, I need some dimensions. Dimensions would be useful. So uh, let's say Uh, let's say I have, oh, I don't know. Um, let's make this six feet, six feet, six feet, and eight feet. And those of you who know your geometry well know why I chose those dimensions. Good old three, four, five triangles. Anyway, um, so we have our dimensions, we have our loads, we have our geometry. Uh, let's first really quick check if this is a determinate truss. So let's just check uh, determinacy to see if we can solve for all the internal forces using just statics. And uh, so let's see, our number of members, 
uh, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So M is nine. Our number of reactions, R, is not the number of supports, but the number of reaction forces, which will be one, two, and three. Um, so we have a, a R then is equal to three. And our number of joints, J, that's relatively simple. Uh, just A, A through F, so one, two, three, four, five, six. And so F, or not F, uh, J is equal to six. And then um, we can say uh, applying our equations of equilibrium, or not of equilibrium, of our equations of determinacy, we can say that M plus R, three plus nine, and we have two J, which is two times six. So that's 12, 12, and those are therefore equal. So we do know that this is a statically determinate truss. And also stable. Well, in order to conclude whether it's stable or not, we would first have to look at the reactions and make sure they're not all parallel or concurrent. And uh, looking at the reactions, I have two like this and one like this. So they are not, not all mutually parallel because I have uh, that CX there is able to, uh, if now if we had, if CX was, if we instead had like a third roller here at, e, at D, um, then all three forces would be parallel. And so we'd have a set of parallel reactions that wouldn't be good. Um, but here, um, all of our reaction forces are not parallel. So we're good there. And they're also not concurrent. In other words, there is no point where all where the lines of action of all three of them meet at one location. So we know that this truss is uh, stable by both the direction of the reactions and uh, by, the re by the equation M plus R equals 2J. Okay, just a callback so, oh, so I don't bit, bump into my own equipment. <laughs> so um, uh, just a callback to some of our trust theory equations and items. Oh, and so all of this would be given and uh, what the requested find would be, um, in case it's not obvious, is just to, in case it's not apparent, would simply be to determine all of the uh, internal number forces. So let's go ahead and do that. So I want to find all of the internal member forces in this truss. So, and I'm going to do that by applying the method of joints. So let's apply method of joints. So let us apply the method of joints. Now, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, there's one of these members here that is really sticking out to me, and that is member AD. And there's something special about that member. Um, any of you recall what that might be? Hmm. Okay, just a just a uh, call back to some of our end discussions yesterday. This is one of those members that is a special force condition. See, at member AD, I have uh, two members, member CD and DE, that ha share the same line of action. In other words, I have a situation like this, basically rotated at an angle. Um, so it's like I had member C, uh, joint D, member, so member CD and member DE, and then joint A. I have one continuous member or one member with the same, uh, two sets of members with the same line of action. And then I have a third member coming into that uh, member AD. And I have no other forces applied to that joint. And what that means by the equations of equilibrium is that AD is a zero force member. And how I'm going to then write that, I'm just going to say that FAD, FAD then 
is a uh, has zero force carried within it. Again, that's just a property of whenever you have a pin joint and uh, two members that continue through the joint and then a third member framing into that with no other members and no other forces present, uh, that will, member AD is then a zero force member. So I know the force in member AD is zero. All right, but that will be useful later. Right now, what I want to do is I want to, because this has three and only three reactions, um, it means that uh, solving for our external reactions is going to be relatively simple because uh, with just three reactions, again, the entire truss is determinant as a single rigid body. So I'm going to draw out the truss as a single rigid body, ignoring all of the internal member forces. And I'm going to just draw the forces that are applied. I'll have CY, CX, and then FY, FY here. And then I'll have my, uh, I do need to draw my forces on here, my six kip and my 10 kip force. The uh, internal members won't be important, but, but any forces that, applied, that are applied are. Again, I'm treating the entire truss as a single rigid body and simply solving for the external reaction forces. As if this truss were just a single lump of matter. Okay, so, and then I should probably go, I have to be proper on my free body diagrams. I should probably put some dimensions lines on those. So this is gonna be eight feet tall. So this is actually a very weirdly dimensioned truss. Um, definitely not really tall enough to be a uh, definitely not really tall enough to be like a, a, a vehicle bridge. Um, even at just eight feet tall, uh, you're just barely big enough to be, you know, some sort of, that's like between floors for an eight foot truss, even this would be really small for like the side of a building or something. But anyway, I just chose the dimensions to be nice and easy to analyze. Oh, sorry, not eight feet, six feet. We're dealing with three, four, five triangles, not um, one, one root two triangles. Thought that geometry stuff would never come back. Nope. Or that trick stuff would never come back. Nope. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and, oh, I don't know. Uh, first, we can go ahead and knock out the CX force by just a balance of forces in the X direction, the horizontal direction. So summation of forces in the X direction on the global free body diagram, I'm going to have CX. Uh, plus 10 kips, and all of this is equal to zero because we are in static equilibrium, assumedly. And so therefore, CX is going to be equal to negative 10 kips. Uh, CX must be equal to negative 10 kips. Then I can do a, so that, so that means it, with a negative, it's actually going to be pointing to the left rather than to the right. Um, then I can do a summation of moments. Oh, let's do a summation of moments about point C counterclockwise positive. So I will have uh, both of my external forces will be generating clockwise or negative moments about point C, while FY will be generating a positive moment. So some moments about C, that means I will have, let's see, um, actually I don't want the equality there, let's put a, might need two, only two lines for that. So um, let's do a negative six kips times a moment arm length of 12 feet, uh, minus 10 kips, times a moment arm length of eight feet. And then plus FY, the reaction at joint F in the Y direction, plus FY um, times a moment arm length of 18 feet, and all of this then equals zero because this is in static equilibrium. All right, so uh, let's see, FY then. 18 times FY is equal to, so six times 12, uh, if I know my math, that is 72 uh, plus 80. And I'm just going to throw that in my calculator because caffeine hasn't quite kicked in yet. I might be able to do that mental math if I thought really hard about it, but... Oh, wait, no. Actually, wait, is that going to be divisible by 9? That will be... 
uh, let's see, that will be 152, so that's not even divisible by 3, so never mind. Can't do that one really uh, too well in my head. Maybe if I thought about it for a little bit longer, but anyway, that is 8.44 kips. Now, I would, have, would not have been able to do that one in my head. Uh, so again, 72 plus 80 divided by 18 is uh, 8.44 kips. We have our Fy force, and then I can just do a summation of forces in the y direction, not to be confused with the force Fy, or the reaction Fy, I'm going to have uh, minus 6 kips uh, plus Fy, which is this 8.44 kips, and uh, plus Cy, all equals 0. And so therefore, Cy is equal to this minus this, or 6 minus 8.44, or negative 2.44 kips. Or in other words, this is actually, uh, Cy is actually in the downward direction. So Cx is, is actually moving to the left. Um, so I can give you, so, well, I'll just go ahead and, um, maybe I'll redraw this on the global, uh, on the overall uh, original free body diagram. So I know that Cx, because we got a negative is actually to the left and I'll, that and pointing to the left I can now make this positive positive to the left of 2.44 kips and cy will be acting oh got my uh labels wrong that should be 10 kips sorry about that that should be 10 kips so this is 10 kips so cx is 10 kips to the left and CY actually acts downward rather than upward. Downward equal to 2.44 kips. And FY, we uh, assume the correct direction. And FY is equal to 8.44 kips. Now, I just, uh, usually I am pretty lazy. And so what I like to do is uh, when solving for these, when setting out my, uh, when, I, when setting out my, uh, free body diagrams um, and applying equilibrium, usually what I do is I just go ahead and assume all my reactions are to the right or upward. Um, if we had thought about this for a while, we probably could have figured out what directions they're actually acting in even before doing any calculations. But, uh, you know, I, if anything, I am lazy. So I usually just say, okay, the reactions are going to the right and upward always. And then if I get a negative when solving for them, I know they're actually going in the opposite direction. But it is also perfectly valid to uh, do a little mental figuring and figure out, okay, I could, for example, I could have said, okay, well, if I imagine this thing rotating about here, well, these are going to rotate, the two external forces will react, uh, will make this thing want to rotate clockwise. So that thing, so the force at uh, joint F has to be acting upward. And then I could do the same thing by imagining rotating about point F. If, uh, well, first I could say that CX has to be going to the left because there's only one horizontal force. And then um, figuring the relationship between, if, then, then figuring a rotation about the joint F, I could think, okay, well, um, well, there's this one wants to rotate this way, this one wants to rotate this way. Ah, there's, and for this, in this particular one, I guess there's no, there's no easy way to do it without doing at least some basic calculations. But anyway, that's six one, half dozen the other. The important thing is that we now have our uh, reaction forces, so we can go ahead and start solving for our uh, internal forces. So we can go ahead and start solving for our internal member forces, and we're going to do this using the method of joints. And when I say draw the truss out in exploded view, we could do one, um, well, there's different ways to do that. You can do it as one giant global free body diagram, or you could do it as a series of small diagrams. I think I'll do kind of both in this example. For illustration purposes.
Okay, so I am going to simply draw all of my joints as circular pins. And uh, so I'm going to include in joints like C. Now, this does not mean that there is a roller at C. It just means there is a pin at C. Um, the pin above the roller, or the pin, the, uh, the pin above the pin, if you want to think of it that way. But uh, that's neither here nor there. So actually, let me label these as disconnected forces rather than continuous members. So I have uh, joints, actually, for these, I like to put the, the labels inside the joints. So let's go ahead and do that and maybe get a little better spacing too. Instead of just tacking on the last one at the end there. So let's do a little bit bigger. So let's say we have, start with that square, like this. Oh, that looks a little better. And then the force is acting on these. Oh, let's go ahead and put some labels on this. A, B, C, D, E, and F. And F. Okay, so the force is here. I know I have my external forces of six kips downwards. Uh, six kips downward and 10 kips to the right. And then I have my reaction forces as well of, uh, let's see, I'm going to have a downward force here of 2.44 kips. And then a force to the left of 10 kips. Um, then uh, I'll have a reaction on joint F, an upward reaction force of 8.44 kips. Now, uh, instead of drawing the members, I'm going to draw out the forces, uh, all of the internal forces. And because this is a truss, all uh, member force, all members will have a single axial force. And I am drawing these as tension. Now, at first it may seem strange, uh, wouldn't tension be going outward if you think of a member? But remember, I am drawing this, I'm drawing these forces here from the joint's point of view. So, Yes, an individual member will be being pulled like this in tension, but in turn, equal and opposite forces, the joints will be pulled toward each other by a tensile force inside the member. So I'm going to label this force FAB. And actually, let me go ahead and, you know, I'll go ahead and put two copies of it on there to make clear that uh, even from both joints perspective, we have the same FAB. And in terms of labeling with trusses, what I usually do is I usually just, uh, you know, have a, I usually just call them all force F, so just like F, and then subscripts to designate the members. And I usually say, um, if I'm, I usually label my joints with uh, alphabetical letters, with letters of the alphabet, alphabetical letters, lovely, um, with letters of the alphabet. And then I'll, um, I'll usually just put whatever joint is, uh, whatever joint uh, name is lowest in the alphabet. So I'll have F. That's why I have FAB, not BA, although, of course, the naming of these is completely arbitrary. Um, then I'll have my FAD and FAD, which we learned is really just a fad, and or in other words, it's a zero force number, and so the force on that one we already determined is zero. Uh, then I'll have FCD and FCD. FCD and FCD and FAC and FAC. And uh, let's see, in terms of, uh, now, if I ever have a diagonal force, I like to put the slope on there. And that we have dimensions of eight feet and six feet. So that is a nice three, four, five triangle. So three in the horizontal, four in the vertical, and then five on the hypotenuse. That, that's pretty, I'm pretty sure that's how you're supposed to say hypotenuse. Um, all dramatic like that. Anyway, um, then in our bot, let's return to our bottom chord. We'll have FDE and FDE. We have our diagonal of FAE 
and FAE. Then we have uh, we have our vertical here, FBE. and FBE, and then we have our exterior diagonal there, or the last member of our top chord, and this is FAF, or FBF, and FBF. Um, so that uh, is like that, and then the slope is going to be on both FBF and FAE, that's again our three, four, five. Um, we have the same slope in all of these, almost like these were determined as an example problem to be relatively simple to solve for the slopes. But no, that makes too much sense. Another three, four, five on FAE. And finally, our last number of force is FEF. And that will be horizontal. So FEF and F. E, F. Okay, so this lovely monstrosity is the global free body diagram for this truss. Um, shown, or not global, I should say the, uh, I wouldn't label that the global free body diagram. This is the uh, truss in exploded view, the total exploded view showing every force in the truss. So this is one way to do it. And then you can also draw out uh, free body diagrams, smaller free body diagrams that, may, that are a little bit, that make the, uh, setting up the equations a little bit easier and usually how I do that is I just start at a I start at a member that I already know at least one of the forces on or in particular I started a member that I don't have any more than two unknowns so if I tried to start at this joint here at joint B for example there are three forces I don't know FAB FBA or FAB FBE and FBF and if I, and I only have two, I'm only going to have two equations of equilibrium um, on each joint. So that will make solving for all three of those directly difficult. However, if I start at joint F, I have only two unknowns on this one, FEF and FBF. So that means I can solve for both the unknowns with just the, uh, just two equations of equilibrium on just that joint. So that's what I'm going to do. So let's go ahead and do, uh, I'm going to draw out a smaller free body diagram. Now, you wouldn't necessarily have to do this, especially on an exam or something, but I think it makes it uh, a little bit easier to see here. So I'm going to have my 8.44 kips. And again, this is joint F. And I'll have FEF uh, to the left here. And FBF. Uh, up and to the left here at my uh, three, four, five uh, slope. Three, four, and five. Now I'm going to start by doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction. And the reason for that is that each of these forces has a, has a, uh, a uh, an x component, but only one of them has the y has a y component. So summation of forces in the y direction, I will have FBF. Now I need to get just the vertical component of this and I could go and find the cosine and run through all that, um, but I think I would rather just multiply by the ratio of the slope to the hypotenuse and that will work just fine. That's basically the same thing as doing the trig. And so that if I want just the vertical component of it, I multiply by the uh, y component over the hypotenuse uh, ratio. Okay, FBF, like that. And then uh, I will have plus 8.44 kips, and that all equals zero. So then FBF, the force in member BF, is going to be equal to 8.44 kips uh, times 5 over 3. And that will come to, let's see, Throwing that in my calculatron. Oh, oh yes. Questions? Oh, shoot. Oh, my goodness. You are correct. Sorry about that. There was a slight error in this. Yes, I have my three, four, fives messed up on this one. Thank you. Four, three. So we have three, three. Thank you to air is human. 
Okay, so four, four, four on the vertical and three on the horizontal. So yes, that is correct. Thank you. So four, so that means we would then have five fourths on this one. So just double checking, we have our three, four, fives. Our four is on our vertical. Um, I think that should be all good. Okay, so then multiplying that by five over four, I get, oh, and also this becomes negative when I move on to the other side, because um, I subtract 8.44, uh, so that will become negative. So I get uh, an FBF of negative, um, let's say negative 3.06 kips. Negative 3.06 kips, and this would be compression. Next, I'm going to do a summation of forces in the horizontal direction on just joint F. So I'll have, based on this free body diagram, I would say that FBF is going to the left or negative. Uh, negative uh, FBF, so that's going to be FBF. And then the horizontal component of it will be times 3 fifths. And then minus FEF. And all of this equals zero because we're in static equilibrium. And so FEF will be equal to negative 3 fifths FBF. Which, if I multiply that out, a negative times negative will produce a positive. And I get a value of 1.83 kips, if I did that math correctly. 1.83 kips. FEF is equal to 1.83 kips. So, going back to our overall truss here, the members, forces that we've solved for, we got this one, this one, and this one. Now, continuing on. So again, we know it's statically determined. I can go ahead and do some writing here. Uh, we'll move on to a different joint. And maybe we'll do joint C. That looks like one where we'll also just have two unknown forces. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Oh. Yeah, that is a very good question. Let me see. Oh. Oh, my goodness. Another lovely error. That's why you multiply by the correct number in your calculator. Sorry about that. So, that you are correct. That should actually be negative 10. 0.6 or 10.56. Helps if you select the correct number in your calculator. So, negative 10.56, thanks for catching that. Actually, that was an exercise to see if you were paying attention. Yeah, we'll go with that. Um, so, uh, and then that times 3 fifths, I get 6.33 kips. And again, that was entirely intentional. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, 6.33 kips. What else? Uh, we've always been at war with Eustasia. There is no war in Boston, say. I don't know. Pick your favorite uh, 1984 type reference. Okay, so 6.33 kips. I think, let me just double check that, times 5 fourth times three-fifths, we are, we should be good. Okay, so uh, let's see, let's do a summation of the forces about joint C, and I'm gonna draw a little mini free body diagram for joint C. And uh, let's see, oh, let's see. Huh. I love crappy puns. So we have a 10 kip force to the left, and we have a, a 2.44 kip force downward. That's what I, I ended up using my calculator, that 2.44 kip force. Then I have FCD. 
and I have FAC. Also at my 3, 4, 5, and this time I'll remember to put the 4 on the vertical. 3, 4, 5. So let's do a summation of forces in the y direction. Uh, I will have negative 2.44 kips times, uh, I want to get the, uh, well, actually not times anything, negative 2.44 kips, and then um, plus FAC. And to get the vertical component, I will multiply by 4 fifths. And all of this equals 0. So therefore, FAC is equal to 2.44 times 5 over 4. And that should equal that number that I had previously, which is, and it should end up positive. And that's the correct number. This is our 3.06 kips. So that's good. Then I can do a summation of forces in the x direction. Uh, so we know FAC is 3.06. So a summation of forces in the x direction, I will have, uh, let's see, negative 10 kips plus FCD, and then plus FAC. Wait, let me double check this. So we have in the vertical direction, um, downward. I believe this is going to be fine. Yeah, those should be opposite, acting equal and opposite. So, okay, that's good. Um, so FAC then. Um, yeah. So FAC, uh, and then to get the horizontal component, I multiply by, um, I multiply by three fifths, and this equals zero. So FCD is equal to three fifths well, negative three-fifths times um, FAC, which is our 3.06 kip force, and then um, plus 10. So 10, um, let's see, that's 10 plus that negative 3.06 times three-fifths, and I get 8.17 kips. Yeah, 8.17 kips. Positive, so this is intention. So we've solved for now we have, we got FCD and FAC, so we got this one and this one. Then let's see, I'll probably move on to doing equilibrium about joint D. And that one will be relatively straightforward. And I do want to finish this example out today. I know we may go a little bit past our couple minutes past our, past our class end time. If you need to scoot out, that's fine. Um, I will, uh, this will all be posted on the course website. I just want to wrap up this uh, one example um, uh, right now. And as a reminder, I'll be posting some uh, more long form examples on both the method of joints and the method of sections. So we have that. Uh, now, let's do a equilibrium on joint D. So joint D, we have a zero member force, so that's just zero kips. Uh, we have FCD, which goes like this, and we have FDE. So we then know um, by simple summation of forces in the x direction, that F, uh, that FCD, FCD simply must be equal to, uh, well, not FCD, FDE. FDE has to be equal to FCD, and so that has to be equal to 8.17 kips. 
has to be equal to 8.17 kips um, because there are no other forces on this joint. So therefore, FDE, or, uh, uh, FDE has to equal FCD, which is, F, which is uh, our 8.17 kips. So that means we then have FDE. And um, let's see, let's go ahead and erase this and find our other um, forces. We have, let's see, we have um, really just three unknown forces left. Actually, you know, maybe I will wrap up here to be on time. I will just describe how to finish this example, and then in our example videos, we'll work through uh, a bit more long form, a bit more long form examples. Okay, so I guess I will wrap up here, and what I'll say is, um, so our unknown forces we still need to get are going to be FAE, FBE, and FAB. And to get those, you're just going to, to get, uh, I would go next to joint A, apply equilibrium about joint A to get AB and AE. Then I'd move on to joint E, and I could quite easily, just by summation of forces in the vertical direction, get FB. And, but I think this uh, overall illustrates the process of the method of joints. All right, that'll do it for now. This concludes our lecture where we're looking uh, at the... Uh, just introducing the method of joints and the method of sections are two primary methods for solving for truss internal number forces. So, and as a reminder, in follow-up lectures, we'll be looking at uh, L plus some follow-up lectures where we look at some uh, long-form examples of both the method of joints and the method of sections, and perhaps even looking at uh, maybe a long, uh, an example or two of solving for uh, zero force members. Anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Um, like, comment, subscribe, etc. to make the robots happy, and I uh, hope you found this video a little bit uh, informative, enjoyable, or at least uh, a little bit useful. So, be on the lookout for those next videos, or if you're watching this much later on, they'll be in the uh, uh, Structural Analysis 1 playlist. Regardless, look forward to seeing y'all again soon, and as always, thank you.